we will start with your life in fishing. Um, so, as we always do, um, where did your sort of fishing career all start? Where did it all start? Um, I was about, how old would it be, 13, 14, something like that. And I used to live quite near a river, and like me and my brother and my two cousins, we used to go pike fishing. I literally get on a bike, strap a couple of rods, <coughs> couple of rods to your crossbar, and off you go down the river. It's literally like schoolboy stuff. We're going to catch a few little tiny roach and bleak, and then try and catch a pike. So we did that for about a couple of years, really. And um, yeah, that was it, really. That was a very, that's the very beginning. That's like, I'd literally like, just first picked a rod up. But um, yeah, never used to catch any big pike, really, like just little jack pikes. There's loads of them. So it sort of just got me into, really. It got me hooked, and so sort of away I went from there, really. The River Folly, it was called. The River More Folly. like a drain, really. There's a, a little drain in Peacock, where I used to live. But, um, yeah. yeah, that was the we very thought. beginning. All sort of drains, those sorts of venues that on obviously that side of the country. And how, how did that sort of progress towards match fishing or course fishing? Um, for um, match yeah, I suppose, I suppose I really like because as I say, this river was literally like a five minute push by ride, and we used to just we just sort of progressed from there. Really, me and my brother, then my brother drifted off, and I carried on and just uh, well, I used to just fish there really all the time, just, and then I be about I suppose 14 probably younger than actually 12 when I first started about 14 I heard of some junior matches so I got into like course fishing side of it obviously and suddenly I've heard of these junior matches and a mate from school was like come and have a go he'd already started and I was like oh that sounds alright I'll have a go at that and I actually remember my very first junior match about 14 15 I think I had like two eels or something <laughs> two eels Chucking a bomb out on this little river, a bomb and a, little, a bit of a worm, but it couldn't get any more traditional, I suppose. And I caught two yeah. little like bootlace eels with about ten ounce between them. Was that was my first ever match. I remember as clear as anything. Probably using a rod from Woolworths or something. Yeah, like, like we all, like we all did. It's that yeah, was yeah. did, wasn't it? And how, did that? Were you? Was it a slow start, or once you'd sort of had that taste for the match, and you you were with your mates, you were competitive? <clears throat> did that sort of progress quite quickly? I think um, it did. Yeah, looking back on it, I did. I just that was it. Then bang. I was never really a sporty person, but I weren't really like football. I used to play rugby a bit, being like the tall kid at school. They could chuck it to me, and like off you go, run with it. But I was never into football or anything like that. So. Yeah. Suddenly, I found some I really like, really could get into sort of thing, and really like passionate about it. And I think I was like it straight away. I just got me hooked, if you like. When was that it? Yeah, that, was yeah that that, it, straight away off off pike fishing, off that side of things, all focused yeah, on. Yeah, that, on that was gone straight away. The pike fishing really worked. There was never anything serious. That was literally just the start of us fishing. But um, yeah, and that was it. Like from then on. It's literally carried on from then to this day. I've never stopped fishing. I've never gone off and done other sports. I've always just been fishing. So, yeah, just sort of cracked on from there, really. Literally 100 mile an hour from then on, then to this day, sort of thing. Brilliant. And did, did you have any sort of specific mentors? A lot of people have spoke to before. I've had a, a couple of key people in their sort of angling careers that have really helped them, whether that was like, um, like somebody who ran the junior clubs or the... The national team at the time with the juniors or even as you got a bit older um obviously towards the 2000s you joined Essex County and um, obviously some massive names within that particular team um oh, what... really, yeah. I suppose when I was when I was originally team fishing you know, I went from the junior team to then I progressed to the senior team if you like with Peter but there's one bloke Dave Panton his name is He's still about now, still really good friends with him now. And and he was a bit of a mentor. We used to, he was we were like teenage late teenagers, early twenties, and he'd probably be about forty ish, fifty maybe. And he was like he, he took us all under his wing, sort of thing. Real good angler. Won loads of matches in his time and all that. And he we used to sit around his house for hours like make, making rigs. He used to make a lot of tackle. Like back in the days, sort or of, you can buy stuff, and he's all he's like inventing things all the while. He still he laughs about things nowadays. He's like, Yeah, I built one of them 20 years ago. He's like, Things <laughs> that come out nowadays, and he probably did. 
So he was, he was a bit of a mentor, yeah, definitely. Took yeah. his whole life to place, really. I think those sorts of people are really important because those people that have the, the sort of creative brain to create product and tackle are the yeah. ones that usually explain to you why they're making it rather than using something else sort of thing or, or yeah. doctor, doctor in certain products and, and eventually you see that the tackle companies then bring them out because yeah. similarly, similarly thinking people do the same and doctor it and then the tackle company think well we'll change ours because that's obviously what people want and I think I think as like a young angler somebody who can show you those sorts of things really helps because it gets you thinking about the same sort of things why, yeah. why is he cutting a float down to be shorter and stumpier or whatever it may oh, be why would you use a thicker bristle like simple things like that it just gets you thinking and just sort of evolved from there massively there you mentioned floats that's like a perfect example if a float weren't right, I can tell nowadays, as soon as I get a float, I think, that's not right. I need a tiny bit off the tip, tiny bit off the off the stem, whatever. And he was doing that years ago. He was, I'd go around his house, look at this, what I made, Winnie, and he's got the like, doctor to float, and I'm like, that's perfect. That's how it should have been in the first place. And it's still, I'm still a bit like that these days. I'm like, if something ain't quite right, just some tinker a little bit. You know yourself when things are right. And I say he was doing that well, well before his time, before everyone's time, really. I remember yeah. making up ready rods. He was doing that years and years ago. And he'd, cut, he'd turn up with like a rod in his hand, already made up, like folded down. He didn't have the cases then, but and he was doing this like 25 years ago, well before anything was invented like that. Yeah, like but I think it's people like that that actually help push it forward. Because I suppose for every, <clears> if they come up with 10 ideas or whatever, there's going to be some that people think, oh, that's a bit weird. But no. then there's going to be a certain amount that then end up being decent ideas going forward. And like, look at sort of like method feeders, jiggers, whenever you mention them, there's so many people who seem to have like come up with a similar sort of concept at a similar sort of time. Like <laughs> people claiming that they've invented it or it, a, a version of it where it's obviously people, especially with like the commercial side of things where at the time it was all new, there was people just coming to the same sort of conclusions all the time, wasn't there? Yeah, definitely, yeah. He, he, I say he used to come up with things all the time. I used to have, that's why I've got a fishing room now, because he had, and we used to sit in there for hours, and he'd just show me things, and just about four of them, he's like, oh, that's brilliant. Now, so, so why, why can't you get them in the shops? Not even that long ago, really, he was doing it. And like, well, even nowadays, he's, he sits in his room, I think, still made, he don't fish a lot now, I don't think. But he still sits there making stuff. I'm sure he does. Yeah, I suppose that from from your side of things now, having that background, it helps with obviously working with Browning and Frenzy before that, where you don't just look at a product. You're saying, oh, "I don't like this" or "I like this." It's why don't you like it? What you change, rather than just saying, "No, that shit." Yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah, I thought it's easier to do that, and it just go, "Yeah, that's rubbish." And you go, well, why is it? Yeah. If, yeah. I always look at things, if something's not quite right, but you think that definitely could be a little bit better, then it'd be perfect. And I suppose there's a lot of things you could say like that, that's not quite right, but then you tinker about them, and then the next thing the, the companies make them like that, exactly like that sort of thing. But, yeah. Definitely. And so yeah. moving on from sort of that, that junior setup, the intermediate setup, and going from that, obviously Essex County, um, you join them at the time, arguably. The best team, um, definitely one of the best, probably the best at that, at that particular time, um, along with Barnsley and so on. Yeah. Um, who were you fishing with at that point and, and what did they show you? Did they send you in a different direction? Obviously, your early life was very much revolved around natural venues. Was that still the case? Yeah, it changed a little bit, but still on the natural venues, I... Well, going back to the heroes thing, one of one of my heroes, Kim Milson, he had just left just as I joined Essex, and it's quite annoying, really. I thought I've been asked to join the team, and I'm actually fishing with like probably my all-time hero at the time, sort of thing. And then he just left, so it was, it was really annoying. I thought well, that, that chance had gone and all that, but under the fishing side of it, I was still natural water fishing. But all canals, we used to fish a lot of canals in the winter league. And I've done a bit of it, but similar to the drains, and I had to sort of learn a bit about the canals. And obviously, I'm fishing with Mark Pollard, Pete Vasey, yeah. Derek Young, I think he just left. 
Andy Mead, at Darren Davis, he's like the best canal anglers in the country. Yeah. So it, it didn't take me long to get up to speed, sort of thing. And within like, I don't know, a year, six months, a year, I was like one of the first names on the sheet. And I was proud, really. Like, it was an honour to be in the team in the first place. And then my good friend Wayne Swinscoe, he, he was like putting me top of the list almost. And I'd only been there a year or two. And, but yeah, it's, I really enjoyed that. Brilliant, brilliant time in my life for fishing, mostly canals. We used to fish like the national and things and super leagues in summer. But the winter was the best time. We had like six, obviously six winter league matches, the practice matches, all canal fishing. Yeah. I loved it really. I was not really known as being a canal angler, but back then I was. Like, that was the yeah. whole winter. I used to fish the area, wash canal as well on a Saturday. I won loads of things on them, really, and I loved it. A real, really enjoyable time of, of my fishing life, really. Yeah, well, but, like, obviously you mentioned there that you're not really recognised for the natural venue side of it now, but back then that's all you did, effectively, pretty much, wasn't it? And yeah, yeah. With Essex County, you, you won Winter League finals, you framed in Winter League finals, um, you have two team championships to your name as well, county champions, overall individual winner. Um, you've got lots of achievements on on those natural venues. Not to mention that you used to go to Ireland a lot as well, I believe. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And Done well over there. Won, well, yeah, yeah. Won won a few Irish festivals, loads of top ten finishes. King of clubs, third in that. Yeah, done nice. You've got a, a massive um, list of achievements on the natural event. Yeah, it's almost like I've been I've been two different anglers really. I've sort of. I've had that point, I don't know how many years it was, it's probably 15 years, might be longer, <clears throat> just natural water fishing. And it's almost like I started again, sort of thing, like, I don't know, say 10 years ago, suddenly I'm a commercial angler now, and all the young lads these days, they probably don't even know I fished a drain or a canal or rivers. But like I had years doing it, and lots of, lots of good, successful years doing it. And how, how was that transition? Obviously, it was 2007, I believe, when Essex County disbanded. Um, was it quite a quick thing from there? Was it that and when Essex County sort of disbanded, you thought, right, I'm going to focus on individual commercials? Or did you do a bit of individual on natural venues and then sort of transition towards commercials? What, what was the situation there? Um, it was a bit of a funny one, really, yes. I just started fishing decoy a bit. I'd started going there in the old close season. So I'd have three months a year of going to decoy, but then as soon as the season, between the 16th, that would be it. I wouldn't go near it until the following uh, close season. So I'd sort of dip my toe in, if you like. I'd sort of having a go at it. and I was doing all right, but I was only fishing decoy. But then it was like the team finished. I remember as clear as anything, the date finished. And I did have a little while of thinking, Right, well, this what am I doing now? I, was, I couldn't decide what to do. I, my main fishing was just team fishing. That was it. Loved team fishing from I'd say that real early age, fifteen till I say two thousand seven, whatever old I was then. I lose track, and that was everything. Team fishing was everything, and suddenly it's not there. It's like, what, where do I go now? And I say I've been doing a bit of decoy, and really I just did that. I sort of I thought right. I didn't really want to do any more team fishing. I didn't want to go and fish for another team. That was it, really. I sort of, sort of thought, that's it. My team fishing's done. I didn't want to drop down, if you like. So I just sort of went uh, decoy, really. I probably had, I don't know, four or five years. Just went there. and I was still doing a little bit of natural water fishing, sort of mixing the two up a bit. Yeah. And it got to a point where I sort of had to make a decision, really. I sort of thought, one way or the other, I'd have a real sort of good go at it. And... I, sort of dis- I, was, I think I was just enjoying commercial fishing more than natural fishing. That's what it came down to. Sit on a drain and catch three or four pound or go and catch a hundred pound of F1s and carp. It was like a bit of a no-brainer, really. I was really yeah. enjoying my fishing again and something completely different. I just sort of basically started from there again. That was like my second career, if you like, my second fishing career. Did you, find, did you find that kind of coming from that natural background... Did that help you on a commercial side of things, or do you kind of feel that people coming into it from almost no match fishing background at all pick it up quicker? Was it sort of working for you or against you? I think no. I think it did. It worked for me. But the basics are the same when you look at it: feeding and presentation, and that's that's what I think all fishing comes down to. And 
fish in natural venues, you've got your feeding and presentations, it'll be spot on and you just carry that through. Well, that's what I thought. Anyway, just carried it through to the commercial side. But definitely, I don't think, definitely didn't hinder me. No, it's a sort of pretty, pretty easy transition, really. Not, definitely help, yeah. Like, even now, like the, say, like the White Acres Festival, you have a day on Porth. It's, for me, it's just like going back in time. It's like a day on Porth. I oh, used to do that, do that with my eyes shut, sort of thing. Yeah. A lot, a lot of the lads have never done it. It's a blind day. Yeah, it's a big, that is a big advantage down there, isn't it? Where on those weeks, that's generally, when you talk to people, that's a week, uh, that's a day that they're dreading almost because it's yeah. not, oh, not the sort of stuff they do. No, a lot of people slip up. You hear it in the bar at night and they're like, I'm dreading going to Porth. They're doing well in the festival. They've got Porth to go to and I'm thinking, I can't wait. I love, I love going there and you want them anglers in your section because you're that far ahead normally. They're never going to beat you, but... I've seen a lot of festivals thrown away down there because they don't know what they're doing on Porth. They, well, they just think, oh, I'll go and chuck a feeder all day, come back and they've weighed a pound or something. Yeah. And that's your festival's over. Like you've done. You can't throw a day away in a festival. That's, it's all yeah. over, basically. White, White Acres has become quite a big, well, a very big part of your sort of angling year. Um, obviously, you enjoy it down there. Is that the, is that the social aspect, the fishing? The fact that there's a bit of money to be won. What what's your sort of what it's, and everything? What what do you it's think? All, it's, it's all of them, Jay. Everything you just said is all of them three things. Really, it's, the fishing comes first. Obviously, you go there for the fishing, for the festivals. You want to do well at the festivals, and but the social side of it as well. It's it's all part of it, really. You go to the bar every night and a few beers, talk about the fishing, basically rip people to bits and whatever, which is all good fun. How, how has that changed over the in terms of the social side of it? I, I, I've noticed more at White because it's, it's changed quite a bit. I don't go. I'm not. I'm not sort of a serial festival goer. Um, but the festivals that I have fished, it's the social side of it isn't quite what you hear from the glory days as such. No, that's dead right. Actually. I think I, I missed that really. I weren't. Oh, I wasn't going there then. But like I said, the real glory days. You go in the bar and it's full of 180 anglers. That, that don't happen anymore, but you got sort of different people there, really. you got people that go and just fish. It's fair enough, everyone's each to their own, isn't it? People just want to yeah. go fishing, go back to the lodge, tie rigs. But like, for us lot, we're like, nah, we want to get there, a couple of beers, like, have a laugh, basically, and it's each to their own, isn't it? You're not, you don't have to do what everyone else does, do you? But it's definitely not like it used to be, from, from what people say. It's not, it used to be packed every night, but we still go there, we have a good, good crack and all that and and the fishing takes care of itself I always think if you're doing well in the festival you're going to do well whether you, you go out to the bar every night or whether you sit in your lodge every night it generally once you're in that zone you're in the zone yeah. once, once you're sat in your box for five hours that's all that matters you, you're in the zone exactly and then as soon as it finishes it's like back to the pub <laughs> Yeah. As Rich knows, <laughs> <laughs> definitely. Uh, no, Rich, and, and your your gang that you go down with, they're all all into it. a bit of a drink, <laughs> an odd drink. <laughs> do, you, do you think that's more more the case then that over the last last few years and everything, it, there's a lot more people taking it more seriously, where they're they're like, right, I'm not going to blow my festival by fishing with a hangover or whatever. Where there's that still group of people that are just like, yeah, we'll we'll fish anyway. Yeah, exactly. I think that's it. We, it is literally like just, we're going to fish. By the time you're fishing, it's 12 o'clock anyway, so your hangover's gone and then you're ready for the fishing, basically. But I say each to the rain if you want to go and sit in your lodge every night, it's up to you. And obviously, we take the fishing seriously. I'll, I'll take it as serious as anyone sitting at home for like weeks on end prepping before I go. But like yeah. I say, it's the same five hours. Is your, that's, the, that's what you're there for, them five hours. And the rest of it just looks after itself, really. Because yeah, is, is, is that what you think sets it sets White Acres apart from other festivals? Because obviously there's there's plenty of other festivals across the country that have got like mega fishing, good turnouts, and everything. But White Acres always seems that little bit more special and a bit more sort of prestige about winning anything down there. I think that's you hit the nail on the head. I think prestige. I think you win a White Acres festival, you, you you've got that on your CV, and I think it's mega. I think it'll always have that. It'll always have that prestige, as far as I'm concerned. Let's say there's there's festivals everywhere now. You sort of win one 
well, we have we have a, a decoy and but you win that and no one sort of hears about it. You win a White Acres Festival and you, you've almost been known forever for it almost. Yeah. Like, it's so hard to win anyway, it's ridiculous. Not yeah, the cal- calibre of angler down there is, is very, very good. The probably the best in terms of festivals. And sp- and yeah. speaking of, so you, you've won five decoy festivals, I believe, um, yeah. over, over the years. Obviously, since making that transition, um, 2015 was your first White Acres Festival win. So that was the Maver Festival, I believe. Maver, I think, yeah. Um, and then to, moving on to 2016 was your was where you won the Guru Festival. Um, you then went into the Preston Festival and qualified for the Park Dean final and managed to win that. Yeah. Um, that was that was sort of as well. Obviously, you won the Guru Festival, but that was sort of the start of a very very good year. Arguably, the the biggest year in your angling career. Um, Twenty five thousand pound. What what was your sort of thinking? Throughout that sort of festival, obviously in the build-up, you didn't you didn't win the Preston Festival, but you did enough to get into the final, which is is always the aim for the Preston Festival. Um, what was your sort of thinking through the final and building up to actually winning it? How how did that go for you? Um, I think I was, I was about eleventh. I think if I remember right, eleventh eleven was a bit of a lucky number for me that week. Um, I just I'd done enough by Thursday night if I remember rightly. I'd done enough so you know you're in the final. I didn't like the last day was irrelevant. It didn't matter what happened. So Thursday, like pressure's off, I got thirty three points if I remember rightly by Thursday. So you're basically you're in the final, whatever happens on the Friday. So there's no pressure on the Friday. It's a nice day's fishing just sitting there. I think I went to pool for the last day. And I think I'd come second or something. I'd like nice days fishing, sort of chilled out. Probably should have won the section, but really probably a bit too chilled out. <laughs> I could have won the section and have ended up like in the top 10 easily, but it didn't really matter. It's all, it's all irrelevant. I think, yeah, I was 11th and then I'm in the final. So, yeah, brilliant. That's all you go down there for, really, is to get into the final. And I made it and I was 11th to draw. And then I drew, that's what I was say about Peggy, Le- uh, number 11. I was 11th to draw and I've drawn Peggy 11. And it was like, and my house number's 11 as well, so there's a lot of 11. Yeah, just all fell into the line. So like, when, when that was happening, were you sort of thinking, oh, 11 again? Like, was, yeah. it, was it something that was in your head then? When it you was, drew uh, that, it was weird. Like, it was like, where's this 11 keep coming from? Like, there's all these number 11s everywhere. So it turned into a lucky number, but people that know Jenny's, like where the final is, they'll know 11's in the little narrow, there's only one narrow peg, yeah. it's the only peg that you can reach across with, uh, to the far bank. But it's not, normally it's dead, there's nothing lives there, it's just, so when I drew it, it's like, pfft. it's almost like, chuck it away, that's no good, let's go home. Wheel spin out of the car park. Yeah. But I remember sitting on my box thinking, I think Tom Scully was about, and he came down, he said, what do you reckon? I went, I said, yeah, now I'm sat here, I've got my rig across, expecting it to be four foot deep, because it's, there's, there's like a load of brambles coming over. Yeah. And I remember putting a rig over there and it went doink. And it was like 18 inches deep. And I suddenly that's thought, well, oh, that's all right. That's nice. I can get into some shallow water, fishing like of 16 metres <coughs> into the shallow water. I thought, you know what? Yeah, if there's any carp going to swim through here, they're going to be there. And I had a nice edge to fish to as well. I just thought, that'll do. Two lines, dead simple. I think I set up two rigs. I might set up three, actually. I might set up a duplicate for a cross. And I literally thought, that's it. That's all I'm going to set up. I thought, I'm going to ping. I first started off tapping a few pellets across, but I had it in my mind to just ping pellets, fish for 10 bites, basically. Yeah. Because they're all going to be carp, and you only want, say, 40, 50 pounds, normally not far away. So I tapped some pellets in, never had a bite, tapped never had a bite. Started pinging pellets in, got a response within sort of 20 minutes. And I remember thinking, that's it, I'm going to do this for five hours. I'm going to have, just do this, ping pellets and fish for 10 bites. I think in the first hour, I think I'd had almost 10 bites. I think I'd lost three and got two in. And I'm like, a bit gutted really. I thought them three fish could have been 20 pound plus. I got two in the net for 12, 13 pound. I thought I could be halfway there already. So I was like kicking myself really. Just sat, basically sat on that method all day long, ping pellets, ping pellets. You knew when there's one in your peg, yeah. you start getting a few liners and then bang, you got a fish on. Then it's like shit back 100 mile an hour to get away from the all this rubbish on the far bank. I've only lost 
apart from that first hour, I lost two or three, and I lost two more through the day. And it's all because of these brambles. They're like straight in them, shit back. And I remember a lot of things about an hour to go. Well, no, actually, so I missed the, uh, the best bit of the match. It was at that middle sort of 40 minutes. I probably got 30 pounds in my net. Yeah. And I remember going in and I, I got a foul look seven pound and I got it in. It was in the tail. It took me ages to get in. And that moment sort of changed the match. I went, I had a spell of, I think it's five fish for 42 pound or something. And that was basically, that won me the match. It was all over. Yeah. Suddenly I've got 60 plus pound in my net and there's like two hours left. I sort of effectively the match was won, but I've still got two hours left. I think I ended up with 90 some pound, 95 and second was 40 pounds. So yeah, I was like miles ahead and ridiculous weight. Still, isn't it? still didn't think, I was still thinking last hour, I'm fishing my heart out, trying to get, I'd lead carry on my right. So they're all having a bit of a joke, or well, they were to my right, and I'm still like, don't miss a bite, don't miss a bite. And they're like, you've won it when it's all over. I'm still, <laughs> I don't care what you say, I'm still fishing till the end, like fishing my heart out, wait, trying to not miss a bite. Yeah, it's in, it's in them sorts of moments that you think <clears throat> you remember all the times you've been beat by a pound or like exactly. sweat really close, and you, or you think you've won and get the way, way board goes round and someone pips you. And it, what, uh, what kept ringing in my head was Andy Levers was two to my right, and he had exactly the same situation when he won it. They told him, you've won it, you've won it, you're well clear. And then I think he beat Ben Fish by five ounces or something ridiculous. And they were like, where'd that come from? No one had even seen him catch anything. He had, I think he had 70, 80 pound of F1s, Carasios. And it was all, Andy's like heart jumped out of his chest sort of thing. He's like, I thought I'd won it, I thought I'd easily won it. So he could have been second and not even known nothing about it. Yeah. So that, was, that kept sticking in my mind. I thought, no, I followed the scales all the way to the end. I'm like, you've won it. Don't matter. So I don't care until I see the last angler weigh in. That's what I did. Yeah. So awesome day. Yeah. Ridiculous <laughs> early. So 25 grand in the bank. And then we're, then you moved on. Maver match this. Had you qualified for the final for Maver before White Acres or was it after that you actually qualified? No, it was before. The final was before as well, weren't it? Yeah. Oh, okay. So maybe match this happened first. So yeah, yeah the, that was about a month before, I think, yeah. Right. And so that maybe match this final. So it had moved from Larford um, to Hayfield. So where, where had you actually qualified from that year? I qualified at Larford. I, I qualified the year before at Larford on the Specy Lake. And then I went and qualified again. On, I think I was on the Match Lake the second time I qualified. So, yeah, like a lucky venue for me, really. Yeah. So, so I'd, I'd that's where 11 come from again. It was, I think I'd qualified on the 11th qualifier. <laughs> I just got to look, I thought, that's weird. I'm 11, it's the 11th qualifier, the Maver. <laughs> and then we, <laughs> what's going on? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then, so that was that was sort of a situation there because you'd, you'd been doing so well at Laugh and qualifying a couple of times. And then, obviously, the final got moved from Larford to Hayfield that year, I believe. Um, yeah. And then, but Hayfield, that sort of style of fishing, pellets, keep it simple for car, that that suited you as well, and you did the business. Biggest, um, biggest prize fund, the seventy thousand pound. Obviously, yeah. on the day, the weather was disgusting, uh, <laughs> and you had a bit of, bit, of, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> bit of a battle with um, Jamie Hughes on the next yeah. day. Um, how how was that match, and how did that sort of differ? Obviously, you just mentioned there. Part D Masters, you were miles ahead, but obviously stayed with it. Maybe match this was never really like that as such. I know that you did actually take a lead, but towards the end, Jamie started really clawing things back from what I can remember. Um, what was, yeah. How was that match? Um, yes, I think the way people were looking at it on the day wasn't quite right because it was people had it as though we, we were like neck and neck all day. And I don't think it was. I think. In my mind, I'm fishing away, thinking I'm ahead. All I keep hearing on the tannoy is it's fish for fish, fish for fish. And the, the more I look back on it, and I've seen the video, and I think I, oh, I must have been ahead because Jamie's had a mega hour, I think, when he dropped on his short line. Well, not even an hour, I don't think. He's had like four or five great big ones, probably 30, 40 pound. And that's, to me, that was when the match suddenly tightened up. And I, well, I tightened up. I've, I've gone from a nice, simple match. <laughs> it was horrible. It was the worst hour, worst hour of my life. I was 
I'm thinking I'm doing everything nice. And in my head, I think I'm, I'm beating him, I'm beating him. And I didn't even look at him. Like, never look around once for four hours. I'm just being like, oh, me float. Don't even look at, don't look anywhere. Don't miss a bite. And then all of a sudden, he's had these lumps short of which, you remember, he was there, weren't you, Richard? I think he was behind yeah. Jamie, weren't you? Yeah, I think four or five lumps real quick to get short, didn't he? Yeah, well, I think that was sort of the almost turning point because I think it probably was fish for fish, but because he was chucking method to the island, obviously, yeah, he was, yeah, yeah. his were a lot smaller. You you being sat on that short line, I think yours, like every fish was a proper one, wasn't it, effectively? Yeah, I think saying that, yeah, I think you're dead right. Actually. Yeah, he's, he's had a lot of carassios and things like that, and so probably, yeah, he probably was fish for fish, but. Mine are like all like six to ten pounders, and yeah, and then that I think you were sort of like bound. Neither of you wanted to change anything. I don't think you ever were going to, but obviously no. Jamie didn't didn't want to drop short and then it not work. But I think that was a turning point where he's sort of dropped that method line, come short. Then that's where he's blasted out four or five prop ones dead quick, and yeah, and I know if he. Had- he had a snag in his peg as well, which I didn't know. I didn't know about it at the time. So every time I look around, he's up to fish. I'm just right that off. He's got another one, but apparently he was losing them in snags. And in my mind, I'm thinking that's another fish. Yeah, like, it's been horrendous, really. Like, up losing fish in a snag on a day like that couldn't be anything worse. Though. I think you saying that. I'm sure after the event, I'm I'm sure it was Dale Shepherd afterwards said. Oh, yeah, I meant to tell you about that snag, sorry. <laughs> <Cheers, man. laughs> That's yeah. probably not, not, not what you wanted to hear that, but I don't yeah. know. I think it was Dale, but I'm not 100%. So. Yeah, it was a good, good job I put that branch in there overnight, weren't it? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> no, it's, it's ridiculous. It's, like, it's the last day I would, well, that, I think it was the fourth hour where we had that mega spell, and that ruined my peg, basically. That was my short line, just went. I thought, I can't really change. I've still got to stick with it because I'm still getting an odd fish that completely messed mine up when he when he's dropped short. And I think that was, well, that was a time I was thinking, that's it, it do, he's going to do me now. He's going to carry on catching short. Mine's all gone to rubbish. I'm fair looking fish, losing everything. And I remember last hour, I've had something like two fish or something and had one right on the whistle. And I, sort of, I thought that one on the whistle might be the one that wins it, but turned out... It didn't really matter. I think I think it'd been really close without it, but I didn't need it, sort of thing. Yeah, I think it was yeah, the last hour. Weeks. Yeah, the last hour was just horrendous. So I was ready to chuckle my gear in and snap my pole to bits and <laughs> but luckily got away with it. So. <laughs> yeah. What what were you doing? Was it literally just just case of pellets on that short line, sit on it all day and just tap tapping a few in? That was it, yeah. In the practice matches, we'd fished two that the week before it. I think I was with Simon Skelm. We kept bumping in, drawing near each other. We both sort of said the same thing, like you could catch on that all day if, it, if there's enough fish there. And even the quiet spells, you could catch an odd big skimmer. And I thought, if I can just keep nicking fish off that line, keep getting bites off anything, I thought I'd stick with it. I was definitely going to start on it and definitely going to finish on it. And I thought, if that middle spell of the match, I'm just keep nicking odd fish, I won't bother doing anything else. And it turned out to be even better than I thought. I just carried on catching carp all day. The skimmer, I think I had one skimmer all day. And the middle, the middle bit was probably the best bit of the match. The time where I was going to come off it, probably the best yeah. spell of the match. Yeah. So, yeah, nice and simple. And never had to think about it too much. Which is from from the bonus. things you're speaking about, both matches there, the simplicity of your fishing seems to be one of like the key things that you sort of take on board. Limit how many lines you're fishing. Keep it simple and just focus your attentions, and th- that works very well for you. Definitely, yeah. Going back to the like the heroes, if you like, Kim Milson, that's what he was all about. Everything he did was dead simple. His rigs were just made to catch fish, basically. There's no faffing around, as you call it. Just dead simple fish, one or two lines, and make you and just uh, concentrate more on your feeding and presentation, not worrying about all the other stuff that comes with it. Just fish really well a couple of lines and I sort of try and stick to that now really. And that is my fishing really. If I can fish one or two lines, two lines I suppose, and make it just make them work really. I'll try and make them work. Yeah. Just yeah, simple. Simpler the better. <laughs> the less rigs are better, but I'd rather set up two rigs the same that do the same <laughs> job than like five, ten top kits that are all gonna do nothing. I'd yeah. rather have like duplicates and 
anything to sort be of as efficient as you can. More on. efficient, yeah. yeah. Definitely, yeah. yeah. I think if that that's probably more coming from that sort of qualifier big money background as well, where <clears> if you're on to plan B, C or D, you're not winning it at the end of the day. Yeah, you're not, yeah. you're you're not in the fishing final. for sections or anything like that. It's, you, you're there to win. So I suppose that that is a way to win those sort of matches, isn't it? Definitely, yeah. And like we said earlier, I haven't been brought up from that background. I've been brought up with the team fishing mentality, catching every fish you can and every ounce is his point. So I've had to change the mindset of it. I still do now. I have to switch around from like fishing a festival one week. You've got to change your mindset to what, what matches you're fishing. Like I said, the big qualifiers, you're fishing to win and that's it. Then you go and fish a festival, you're trying to catch every fish that counts and points and everything and but yeah, it's, simplest is definitely the way for me. Simpler the better. And obviously that year, 2016, brilliant. 95,000 if you just count those two matches, but overall, well over £100,000 with like the festival wins, all that sort yeah. of thing. Um, obviously there's, I know with yourself, it's not quite, it wasn't quite as clear cut as brilliant, I've got over hundred grand in my bank account. At the time you had a sponsor, um, Frenzy at that, particular time um, and with that sponsorship there was a sort of a bit of give and take really um, yeah. I believe if you could just explain the sort of situation there with with how they sort of helped you get on as many qualifiers as you could by funding and different things like that but then there yeah. was a bit of take from their end at the other end of things as well yeah no definitely it was basically part that was all part of the contract they um have to be obviously signed and everything. It's all official, like all legal, and the sponsorship was basically they used to pay for all my entry fees, all the qualifiers. They done it with a couple of anglers before me, I think, and I just sort of carried it on and paid all my entry fees, which comes to a lot of money at the end of the day. It's all fifty quid to enter, and and then the contract was basically if I if I ever win a final, I had to give them like half of the money, which was like. I knew that all along. That was part of the part of the deal. It was never, never like something I weren't going to do. It was, it hurt, don't get me wrong. <laughs> yeah, went away thirty five grand, but it, it's part of the. That's what it was. The deal was the deal. It's never about. It's not about the money, anyways. It's no, it's, it's, it's about the prestige, and I suppose as well. It, like <clears throat> the reason I've sort of mentioned that is just because I don't think people sort of see that side of things, no. um, but also. I suppose knowing that a company, for example, if you if you know that somebody's paying your entry fees, you're probably more inclined to enter more matches. Um, so people yeah. could see that as, oh, you've gave half your winnings away. But at the same time, would you necessarily fish as, or fished as many qualifiers back then as you were doing? Um, I, I, I wouldn't. I think you're dead right. It's, it was out of the equation. Then. You weren't thinking, I'm not going to go there. It's, it's another expensive match. I never even thought about it. I was like, where's the next qualifier? It's three hours away, I'm going there. It didn't yeah. matter where, because the entry fees forgot about. And yeah, a lot of people moaning, I can't afford to do it. It's fair enough, like, we've all been there. And, but I was, yeah, I've just fished everywhere, basically. It, it yeah. didn't matter. It's, it was took out of the equation, yeah. The, through that money. summer period, it's like 50 quid this week, 50 quid on the weekend, 25 yeah. quid in the week, another 50 quid. It, it, it soon adds up. And obviously that that side of the sponsorship, it's obviously you do your bit as a sponsored angler and, and that was their contribution. And there was just that at the end of it. And that's how it was. It, it worked both ways and it helped both yeah. companies at the end of the Definitely, day. Definitely, yeah. Massively worked both ways. Cause week in, week out, I'm basically fishing for free, if you like, like no entry fee. You never really think you're going to win a final. I'm sure they never really think that. But it was down in black and white. So, I don't like I say, it did hurt, joke about it. Money's money. But at the end of the day, it was the deal. And I think back to it now, like, definitely it was the right thing. Like, it's, it's what it was. It was the deal. And I yeah. say, then I went to White Acres three weeks later and got most of it back. So, <laughs> that, that yeah. eased the blow a bit. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. And, and but, um, um, with the... <clears throat> With that, you mentioned there, it's not about the money, um, and you hear, you hear pretty much every angler that is involved in these events say that, um, as well as, obviously, the money, which is great, but I'm guessing that in terms of your profile, you're an angling coach as well, 
I'm guessing that that actually brought you extra work in terms of coaching as well. Your angling profile went through the roof, especially obviously people already already knew you, but in terms of like you as a commercial venue powerhouse as such, so many, Joe Public now knows John Wincup and yeah. wants to get coaching off the guy who's just won made matches and the Part D Masters final. I'm guessing that sort of helped on that side of things as well in terms of your coaching side. Oh, definitely, yeah, massively. As I, was, I remember getting bookings, really. Like, a lot of the time, the anglers weren't even bothered. They just wanted to sit there and sit there and have a chat, basically. And I've been out of anglers, well, most of them want to learn, but some of them yeah, literally just want to talk about the finals because they're all still fresh in everyone's mind. And Yeah, I helped massively, yeah. It's, a, a year like that is, I suppose, it's ridiculous, really. It's, your profile goes through the roof. And what's, what I sort of noticed about it, people, I say Joe Public, outside of angling, like people congratulate me in, in, the, well, in the school play. I used to pick my young lad up. People in the school play, I'm well done, John. I'm like, never seen them before. And <laughs> hey, you've won this and won that. And it's, that was a weird bit. People didn't have a clue about fishing, didn't even know I went fishing, really. And like the headmaster coming over, as I'm stuck in one, the headmaster came over, shook my hand. Well done, Mr. Oh, Wink. I'm like, oh, cheers, mate. <laughs> It's weird, it's uh, sort of outside of angling, not just anglers saying well done. So I suppose that has probably a lot to do with the money side of it. Someone yeah, outside of it is, oh, you've won 100, how have you done that? And yeah, I think as soon as, won... as, soon Sorry, as you yeah. get that, as soon as you get that big money into it and anything that's on TV as well seems to be a big, big thing for some reason, that, that's where it almost becomes a proper sport in everyone else's eyes, I think. Definitely, yeah. If you you went and spoke to someone and said, yeah, I've just won the Maver Maxis 100 quid or whatever, they wouldn't Fish care, it. would they? Yeah. They, wouldn't, yeah. they wouldn't even know what you're on about. But you say, yeah, I'm on telly, I've just won 100 grand. And then it's suddenly like, what, what, what? So it changes, everyone's, everything changes, yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely. Like I say, it's, it's, it's classed as a, a sport. It is, isn't it? It's, we, all, we all know that, but to the, the outside public, a lot of them's fishing there. It's not a sport, but yeah. we all know it is. It costs a lot of money and dedication to do it and time and effort. And So, yeah, it's definitely definitely a sport to us. <clears throat> definitely. Um, and so, obviously, you've gone from Frenzy. You're now with Browning. Um, that was relatively recent sort of thing, last year, I believe. Um, yeah. Is that a move that sort of was just natural for you? Um, I believe you're still you're still working, aren't you? So you never yeah. sort of stop working. You're a postman by trade. Um, so in terms of moving on with your angling on the angling side of things, with Brown, was, was it just a, a natural sort of progression in, in your angling? Or um, yeah, I think so. Yeah, it's, like I say yeah, I'm still working, and that's so I'm not I'm not full time angler or anything. The coaching really, sort of, as and when and. So yeah, I'm still still actually a working man, if you like. Well, so I turn up anyway. I don't like to do too much. <laughs> <laughs> I turn up and show my face. But, um, it's, it was a bit of a natural thing, really. Was, I love my time at Frenzy. It was brilliant. I, my first real main spot. I had a couple of things before, but that was my first real proper sponsor, if you like. And I love my time there. And the, the tackle was good, and I say the people were good to me. And sort of come out of the blue, really. Browning it was just a bit. Friends who were going through a bit of a strange time, they were, they were being sold, and so suddenly rumours were going around. And where are you going to? I'm not like, going anywhere. It's like I didn't know that the business side, I didn't know what was going on there. I was just staying where I am, but then sort of Browning phone call just came out of the blue, and I didn't accept it straight away, to be honest. I was a bit, I weren't sure what to do. I had to sort of actually said, Do you mind if I sort of think about it? And I think. On the end of the phone, they must have thought, what's he on about, thinking about it? Should have snapped their hands off. And but it's such a strange time. I thought, I just needed the time to get my head around it all a bit. And yeah, especially when you've had so much success under one sort of banner. Yeah. There's no reason necessarily. But obviously, Browning are a massive company, um, yeah. owned by Zagco. Some some fantastic products as well. So yeah. I, think, I think that's what done it, really. It was, it was more a case of, I started looking into the, the tackle and I never really used much of it and I started like the pole the sphere pole and the rods and I started looking oh this is awesome tackle that's what swayed it more than anything I remember picking up one of the sphere poles at decoy Johnny Smalley the owner he had it, had it up in his back garden that almost made my mind up I thought 
this is awesome stuff. And the more I looked into it, well, if I if I turned it down, I'd have been basically an idiot. So I, mean, I, well, I can't turn that down. Might not get another chance. At me, day you get, you get asked, you say no, they ain't gonna ask you again, are they? Yeah. And I said, the more for so it sort of just made sense of what well, yeah. Thank Frenzy, thanks very much for the, everything they've done and we parted on good terms and whatever. And then, yeah, and then when joined Browning, I, I love it. Now I'm there and all my gear's sorted out and I love it now, yeah. Best thing I've done, really. As yeah, much as I love my time at Frenzy, it's just another chapter, really, starting again. But yeah, it's that, good. That did seem to be a big turning point for that for <clears throat> Browning, doesn't it? When them sphere rods and, and the poles suddenly... In, I think in the UK, especially, obviously in Europe, they've been been about for, for ages. In the UK, they've kind of them spheres just seem to kind of like catapult them into everyone's mind, didn't they? Especially when when the poles came out, like they they're always there or thereabouts. I think on the pole side of things, but that yeah. almost stepped it up a bit, and everyone was like like working in shops and everything, like started talking about them. Suddenly, it was a, one of those options at the very top, wasn't it? I think that's what it was. I'd- I was obviously wasn't there when the sphere poles came out, but I remember people talking about them at the shows and they're saying this pole's ridiculous. Like everyone, even like other manufacturers, are going to have a look at the sphere pole, and I say it's just catapulted them into like another level almost. I say they're a massive company, they're yeah, ridiculously massive, and then like that's just made them. Like, it's a game changer, isn't it? Again, it's like look at the well, that's just ridiculous. But I've never had a pole like it. I've got their PT one. A little yeah. bit stronger, and they're just well, the ridiculous poles, really. It's so good. Obviously, yeah. I know I'm going to say that, but it wasn't. <laughs> was, obviously, I'm going to say that, but just sitting in Johnny's garden, I remember picking it up and thinking, that is just stupid. 16 meters, I'm sitting there, it's like light as a feather. I've never never had a pole like that in my life. Yeah. And that was, well, <laughs> made my mind up. He'll, he'll tell you the same. Well, I think that, that original sphere, it was almost that, that was the first thing everyone was like. It feels amazing, but I don't know how it's going to last. But then you've yeah. got the like people fishing down at Viaduct and stuff with it, and like they're catching 15, 20 pounders week in, week yeah. out. They're like, I can't break it. And it's like, I mean, that, was, that was one, I think, weren't it? Anglers use it for like a year or two. And yeah, basically, you think you're going to snap it, and then you're hauling out 15, 20 pounders with this. Don't make sense, does it? But yeah, that, did it that, job. that's the surprising thing with those is where where you actually see the company behind it, because they're really bit like Browning as a company, are massive on the kind of hunting side of things in America as well, aren't they? They've got, yeah, it's yeah, not, that's not a separate thing, that. Is it as a separate company? So Brown, the actual name Browning's just like a, something you can buy. So it's, Zeb, it's Zebco Europe. Browning, like the Browning guns, is something completely different. I don't know, that's I didn't know that. <laughs> John, John can't get his free guns now. <laughs> yeah, he's going to order a couple of them. <laughs> My son's got some little Nerf guns. He's, he's stepping up to a 12 bore, so I'll get you one of them. <laughs> <laughs> right, we'll end this little bit of a section um, just with a bit of a roundup. So what's what's next for you in your, your fishing? How does your sort of angling calendar, apart from this year, but going yeah. forward, how does your sort of angling calendar look? Um, not a lot's going to change really. I'm just going to carry on the qualifying, qualifying thing. Um, just yeah, keep doing that. I'm going to keep going to White Acres. I sort of, I don't know if you know, I sort of dabbled back again last year in the uh, the river side of it. I fished one of Tom's um, river, what's it called, River Masters, I think. Yeah. I fished that, and I fished the town well and in Spalding a couple of times in winter. Had some had some decent results really in all three matches. Four, I think it was four matches. So that was the first year in I don't know probably five six years I've actually been anywhere near a drain. I sort of half tempting to go down that. Not, I'll never go fully down that road again. But things like the River Fest, if you like, I might have a go yeah. at that and just might just might do sort of probably like I say this year's almost written off in it. But I was definitely toying with the idea, but yeah. So I'm still going to carry on uh, all the others, fish show. The main three, I suppose, fish show, golden reel, maver, to me anyway. And then obviously the other festivals at White Acres. And I see like, they're the main things for me, really. White Acres and them three big finals. For me, that is the whole the whole summer, if you like, spring, summer time. And then, yeah, that's, that's it for me, really. Not a lot different other than a mite. It is a mite, really, mite. 
go down the other road again, River Fest, and I thought like, like I mean, it was obviously the feed, the feeder side of it as well. I do like me feeder fishing, but then that's a whole other ball game altogether, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah <laughs> that, like, <clears throat> if you if you could pick one bigger then to win now, which one would you pick? Now, well, after what I've done or any time. Yeah. yeah, you've got them. If, if you can pick one in the future that you're going to win, like Part Dean, any of the yeah. 50 granders. I think I've got to say Fisher, yeah. I think, yeah, I've got, I'm not, the Golden Wheel's massive, but I think Fisher's been around the longest, and it's still that definite prestige. I've never really chased a Fisher that much, to be honest. It's been around a long while, I never used to even think about fishing it. And even now, I sort of I put the Maver. I suppose the last three or four years, I always put the Maver ahead of it. If there's a clash, I'll always fish a Maver. Yeah. But now I'm, I'm definitely like, I've never even been in a fish show for one. I suppose I've never really chased it that much. I got close last year. I think it was third in one by a couple of pound. But yeah, I think I'd like to go that way. I'd like to win, definitely like to win that one, yeah. I think, I think if you, you felt like you were getting recognised after the Maver, I think the fish show, with it being on Sky Sports and... The coverage around that, I think that's another level in terms of the coverage and everything yeah, around it. I would like to have a proper, like this year I was, you know, I think I fished one, I think, before all this started, Tunnel Barn, weren't it, I think? Yeah. And, um, and that was it, and then that was it, the end of fishing, weren't it? But yeah, pretty much. I'd, I'd definitely, definitely like to get in that one, yeah. There's, there's so much special about that one, isn't there, definitely? Definitely. Yeah. I think uh, so. We'll end it with that in terms of your life in fishing, and uh, we'll move on to this week's talking point. <laughs> 